Who was the Dark Armored Warrior, Warb Null? How did his armor become one of the most dangerous Sith artifacts in history? Greetings, Acolytes of the Force, and welcome back to the Archives. 3,998 years before the Battle of Yavin, the galaxy was a much different place. Ancient galactic civilization had many strange figures within it, besides just the Jedi and the Sith. One of these figures was a towering warrior in ebony armor, calling himself Warb Null. Warb Null wielded a great saber so large that the hilt alone was longer than an average man's torso. We first learn of Warb Null during the Freed and Nat Uprising, and then later in the Tales of the Jedi Legends comic. Upon first glance, Warb Null is more of a brute serving the ancient dead Sith Lord Freed and Nat, and in this story he is killed rather quickly. However, Noel himself is not entirely the focus here, but rather, his armor is. Some of the most powerful and important armor in all of the history of the Sith. From the moment the armor is forged to the moment we lose track of Warb Null in the history books, the Noel armor leaves a trail of horror and blood in its wake. And today, my friends, we are going to explore the lesser-known character of Warb Null, talk about how dangerous his Sith magic was, and how dangerous Sith magic can be when implemented perfectly into the armor of a dark champion. The origins of Warb Null begin at an unknown point prior to the events of the Freed and Nad Uprising in 3998 BBY. Originally, he was a young man by the name of Shas Dovos. Dovos was a metallurgy prodigy who had big dreams in his field of blacksmithing. All of these dreams, though, would change when he stumbled across an ancient Sith tome and began to decipher it, fascinated by its teachings. After a decade of painstaking study and work, Dovos would become determined to unlock the secrets of this book, convinced now that it was his destiny. His fascination with the book slowly turned to an obsession over it. He could feel it calling to him, urging him, to the point where he felt destined to merge the knowledge in the tome with his own skill in blacksmithing, creating an armor in the power of the dark side and in its name. Dovo shunned everything else in his life just to work on this armor. He left his family, his friends, and even refused to eat. His full origin is revealed to us in the Tales of the Jedi Companion Sourcebook, where it opens on Dovos in his workshop, painstakingly hammering away at his armor. He had not even realized at this point that four days had passed since he had begun. So consumed was he in the dark masterpiece that nothing else mattered to him, not even sleep. At last, his final hammer swing fell, and the armor was complete. Dovos marveled at his creation, speculating on if he ever even held the right to wear it considering he had to steal the sorcery necessary to create it. This power was not his. He even began to wonder how he even accomplished this feat awestruck due to the fact he had no skill in Sith magic whatsoever. We aren't told if Dovos was Force-sensitive or not, but it is reasonable to assume that he has at least a passing knowledge of sensitivity, and a modicum of it considering the Tome was able to call out to him and corrupt his mind. Non-Force-sensitives aren't able to have Force powers channeled through their bodies except through very specific circumstances, so it is more than likely that Dovos has simply never been trained in the ways of the Force, but had the gift innately. But that was when his confirmation was given to him, as an orb of magnificent light hovered towards the young blacksmith. A sinister voice boomed from it and told him that he would wear the armor. Dovos was terrified at first, and his fear only grew when the orb of light expanded into the form of a floating Sith spirit. Once again, the source material here is vague on exactly who the specter was. However, using our context clues, such as the fact that all of this is taking place on Onderon, and there was only one Sith in memory to have been intrinsically tied to Onderon, it is likely that the apparition that appeared before Dovos was none other than the mighty Freed and Nad. The two then begin to speak, where the spirit reveals that it was he who put it in Dovos' dream that the armor was his destiny, and it was Frieden who even gave Dovos the ability to use Sith magic to craft the beautiful creation. Simply put, the Sith Spectre was openly admitting to possessing and manipulating Dovos for the simple fact of this armor being created. Frieden was the one that protected the tome and kept it from crumbling to dust all these years later, hoping it would be found by some victim. It was then that the spirit unveiled his plans for Dovos as he swooped towards the metalworker, the armor pieces coming to life and binding to his flesh. Dovos would become known as Warb Null, a magical merging of man and metal, 
emerging of man and alchemy. Dovos could do nothing but scream, as his entire life and identity was stripped from him, and his life essence was infused into the very armor itself. Warbnol was born, and the mighty warrior would become a servant of the spirit of Freedon and a fierce combatant on the battlefield. When Warbnol appears, he shows up wielding a massive great saber. His origin story is silent on how he actually acquired this magnificent weapon, but we can figure that it was more than likely that he killed a Jedi and took the crystal from their lightsaber, considering that Warbnol's lightsaber was green. This actually would not be a surprise at all since the Jedi were a lot more spread out during the era of Warp Null, and Null was more than capable of defeating a lone Jedi. His armor, as you may have guessed, was infused with a plethora of abilities that made Warp Null a towering terror. The armor had increased whatever force sensitivity Dovos once possessed by nearly 5 to 10 times. It essentially drew the force in and funneled it inside his body, allowing him to contend with seasoned Jedi Masters. The armor itself also had a certain amount of lightsaber resistance, not complete immunity, but it was apparently able to shrug off glancing blows, and only direct hits at certain spots on the armor would actually cut it. Along with this, the armor was enchanted with some sort of passive tutamin as it was able to absorb and then dissipate certain levels of energy. This is likely what gave it the resistance to lightsabers as well. But the most interesting ability that the armor possessed was its aura. This aura brought despair, agony, and dismay to the opponents of Warp Null. When Null was around, his mere presence was an oppressive force that made the strength and resolve of a Jedi weaken. The first we ever see of Warb Knoll is when he arrives on Onderon following the end of the Beast Wars. After having defeated the Wicked Queen of Onderon, who was a servant of Freed and Nad, the Jedi were planning to remove Nad's sarcophagus to the moon on Duk Sun, hoping to purify the planet of Freed and Nad's influence. That is when the cult called the Nadists came up from the ground and attacked the Jedi. Leading the charge and making his grand entrance was Warb Knoll. The Black Knight would proceed to engage not one, not two, but three highly skilled Jedi in combat all at once. Ula Keldroma, his brother Kay, and Os Willem, student of venerated Master Thawne. These Jedi teamed up against Null, and although they were all fierce Jedi, they could not put a scratch in his armor. The battle was short, as the Nadis cultists' only objective was to secure the sarcophagus, and as soon as that happened, Null retreated. Later, Warb Null would return once again when the Jedi went to confront the King Amun of Onderon. The King was believed to have been a servant of Freed and Nad, and when this was revealed, Amun would trap Master Arka Jeth. At that moment, Null entered the scene once again, enraged by Amun and what he had done to his master. Ulit Keldroma would then engage Warb Null by himself in one-on-one -on -one combat. The duel was legendary and fierce, and Ulik felt his strength diminish with every crashing blow from Warb Null, from the monstrous Dark Titan. But suddenly, Ulik felt a burst of energy. Adjusting his lightsaber, Ulik made one decisive cut, driving the blade straight through the right arm and neck of Warb Null, decapitating the Titan instantly. It was revealed that the neck of Warb Null was his weak spot in the armor, and was not as strongly enforced with energy and the dissipation properties as the rest of the armor was. The death of this Dark Knight was swift. Despite the epic and terrifying origins of Warb Null, his career was ultimately disappointingly brief, though this anticlimactic defeat was not the end of his story. The armor of Warb Null would be lost to history, lying dormant on the forgotten backwater planet known as Nichat Ka in a tomb, likely the tomb of Dovos. This tomb wouldn't be uncovered until the very final days of the Clone Wars, when a couple of Jedi archaeologists would come across it. A young Jedi by the name of Talati Kiliman was a member of the Jedi Explorer Corps and hated his life because of it. He was proven to be so much weaker than the rest of the Jedi of his class, and when he was a youngling, he had openly failed his trials. Every single one of the masters looked at him and then passed up on him for training, including the one that he looked up to the most, Master Raeli. He now spent his life excavating old ruins, but after the Battle of Geonosis, Raeli retired from the service as a Jedi Guardian and became a part of the Explorer Corps, now reunited with the individual that looked up to him so many years ago. The Jedi were sent to a Sith excavation site, and while they were doing their work, Talati would go off on his own to explore the rest of the tomb, growing bored with whatever work the Jedi had him do. 
but this is when he found it. Sitting in a large stone chair was the suit, the armor, missing the right gauntlet and having a large scar on the neck. The armor of Borb Nol lay before the young Jedi. Despite having been there for thousands of years, there was not a single speck of dust on Warb Nol's armor, as if all the dust in the room refused to land on it. Talati then saw the great saber hilt sitting before the armor's feet and greatly desired to wield it. He had always wanted a lightsaber, but was unable to construct one due to him not being a real Jedi. He determined to thieve the saber for himself, as it called out to him yet again. He could hear the whispers of the ancient Sith Lords, promising power beyond any Jedi. He reached forward, but suddenly, the armor itself lurched forward and attempted to grab the young Jedi initiate. Talati quickly pulled away, causing the armor to come crashing off the chair and kicking up a huge dust cloud. That was when Talati would be accosted by visions of times past. He would see the ancient Sith, red-skinned aliens holding spears, chanting, throwing them, hoping to strike down an invading ship. Several gray-skinned aliens all being mercilessly chopped down with a massive axe. The red aliens constantly chanted, Adis, Adis, Adis. Talati was literally watching the defense of Korriban from the Rakata by King Adis himself the first Sith King. For those who do not know, King Aedas was a Dark Lord of the Sith that lived many thousands of years before even the Second Great Schism. He is one of the first Sith Lords ever, and one of the most powerful. He was famous for rallying the warring tribes of the Sith pureblood species together to repel the attack on his people by the Rakata. It is a hugely important piece of galactic history, and Talati was watching it all unfold in this vision witnessing the conclusion of the reign of the axe. The vision would then show him the hammer striking the metal when the armor was forged by Dovos, before again switching back to him in the Beast Wars of Onderon. It was in this moment that Talati watched Ula Keldroma kill Warb Nol, only from Nol's perspective now. To Talati, it was as if Ulik was slicing right through his own neck instead. When the Jedi Initiate awoke from these visions, he was wearing the armor and had the helmet poised above his head, ready to wear it himself. That's when he heard the voice of the old Jedi Master that had rejected him, with his lightsaber drawn, commanding the Jedi Initiate to remove the armor. Now, fueled by the massive power of the dark side of the Force, Talati's mind turned to anger and spite. His desire to be a part of the Clone Wars, to make a difference in the galaxy, to be a hero. All of these feelings rose to the surface, and his hatred for the Explorer Corps, his detest of the Jedi Master before him, and the fury of being passed over time and time again by the Jedi finally boiled to the surface. Talati screamed, demanding the Master tell him why he was passed over in the Apprentice Trials, with the Jedi Master bowing his head and saying that they would speak of it later. But Talati was now fully consumed by all of the promises that the armor was whispering to him, all of the ways he could use the power of the armor to crush the Separatists, become the hero of the Clone War, to prove the Jedi wrong. Talati donned the helmet in defiance, ignoring the burning pain that it caused him before attacking the Jedi Master. The two would have a brief duel in the tomb chambers, but Talati quickly realized how much faster, stronger, and more powerful the armor had made him. The armor was funneling the force into his body like a drug. He could see all of the memories and experience of Freed and Nad, King Aedas even, and Dovos. However, when the Jedi Master was being beaten back, he suddenly gained a new piece and began to put up more of a formidable challenge against the new Warb Null. The Jedi Master had centered himself, and now he had become a legitimate threat. Talati was forced back and down to one knee before he activated a secret trick that the armor had whispered to him a secret about Warb Null's lightsaber, a hidden emitter shroud by the pommel which held a secret second blade. Where the traditional blade of Warb Null's great saber was green, the hidden blade was crimson red, revealing that the weapon of Warb Null was not a great saber, but a saber staff in secret all along. A final gift and deception from the armor. Catching the Jedi Master off guard, Talati swiftly used the trick to slice through his jugular. The fallen Jedi was elated as he began to listen to all of the dark whispers telling him of all the great things that he could do with his new power. However, it was in this moment that a chime came from the Jedi Master's comlink. It was Chancellor Palpatine. Palpatine 
telling all the Jedi that the war had ended, and to return to Coruscant immediately. In this very moment, all of Talati's dreams of heroism came crashing down, and he lost himself to his fury. He then declared that he would not be returning to Coruscant, that he was no longer a Jedi. There was always war somewhere, and he would go and find it. It was his new purpose. Talati was dead. He now named himself Malleus, the Hammer of the Dark Side. This story comes from the magazine Star Wars Insider number 147, and unfortunately, this is where the story of Malleus ends, along with the armor of Warp Knoll. I honestly hate that nothing ever came of this origin. The setup was absolutely perfect for a book, comic, or even a TV series. I think Malleus would have been an excellent villain as a Jedi who survived Order 66, but had turned to the dark side prior, roaming the galaxy as a dark warrior in a massive suit of armor. If you could imagine a show or a game set during the time centered around Order 66, maybe even Cal Kestis could encounter Malleus. Or perhaps the Dark Warrior could have his own planet in the Outer Rim or the Unknown Regions. There could even be a possibility that Malleus is only discovered in this new era of canon in the events after Return of the Jedi. We could see an arc where Ezra has to continue his training, leading him to train with Luke, and then the two of them go off on an adventure in search of Jedi knowledge, or artifacts, leading them right into a full-scale war with Malleus, who is now obsessed with fighting and killing Jedi. There would be an opportunity to explore the Sith spirits in canon, as well as maybe even a few flashback sequences of the Freed and Ned Uprising and King Aedas. While speculating stories is interesting, one thing we found very important was the state of Warbnull's lightsaber. In the original comic, it was a large green great saber, and the change to it being a saber staff only happened in this new story. However, this opens up a continuity hole, since Warbnull actually comes before Exar Kun who is famous for being the inventor of the double-bladed lightsaber. Not to mention, most lightsabers used in this era only used the traditional Jedi colors such as green and blue, since the knowledge of creating Sith synthetic red crystals had not been recovered yet. I think the only explanation is this is a feature that Warb Noll did not put in the lightsaber himself, but rather someone else added to it after his death. Why someone would do this to a lightsaber that was not their own, and would simply go on to bury it, is anyone's guess. Either way, the state of Warbnull's lightsaber construction is surrounded with mystery, especially since we don't even know how he got it in the first place. It's not mentioned that Dovos crafted the lightsaber along with the armor. But anyway, my friends, what do you think of the full story of Warb Knoll and the dark legacy that his armor left behind? Did you know of the tale of Warb Knoll before this, and would you be interested in seeing Malleus make an appearance as a main or a secondary villain? Thank you so much as always for visiting the archives today, my friends, and may the Force be with you.